The Tokai Mura criticality accident is over. Volunteers have drained the water jacket surrounding the precipitation tank containing more than 16 kilograms of highly enriched uranium at risk to their health and filled the tank with boric acid, removing the possibility of a second accident. With the active phase of the accident concluded, the focus shifted towards the three people in the immediate vicinity of the accident. Hisashi Owuchi, Masato Shinohara, and Yutaka Yokokawa. In the seconds after the criticality, their health had been irreversibly damaged by the neutrons and gamma rays that pierced their bodies. Over the coming weeks, their bodies would manifest this damage. This is that story, month by month, the medical battle. Before we begin, I would first like to make a statement regarding respect for these three people. What is described over the next few videos is highly sensitive, and equally this story has been fueled with misinformation that only actively harms real living individuals. I will, therefore, take this subject very seriously, and I hope that other people can as well. It's something that I have been researching for several years now. I hope that you understand. By October 1st, the conditions of the three workers had largely improved from an outside appearance. Of the three workers, Orochi ironically seemed the most stable, conscious but with slow reactions, despite estimations from doctors at the National Institute of Radiological Sciences estimating that Orochi had a dose of at least eight sieverts. Shinohara, who had been fading in and out of consciousness all night, was estimated at somewhere between six and eight, and Yokokawa just four. This was still dangerous. Half of the people exposed to 4.5 sieverts in the atomic bombing of Nagasaki would die due to the coming injuries, although they were something that the Institute could treat. Owuchi and Shinohara, however, were in a very precarious position. At their dose levels, it was urgent that they received advanced medical care, something that could only be provided at a well-equipped hospital. The choice seemed obvious. Kazuiko Meikawa, a department professor at the University of Tokyo Hospital, and one of Japan's leading specialists in radiation emergency treatment, offered to take Owuchi under his care at the intensive care unit. Despite hesitation from some physicians at both the Institute and Tokyo, who already considered Owuchi a lost cause despite his apparent good health, the transfer was agreed. For Shinohara, a transfer to the Institute of Medical Science Research Hospital at the University of Tokyo was decided on. Yokokawa was to remain at the National Institute of Radiological Sciences. Before all three men were separated, they all shared last words from their isolation pods. Gambaru, Yokokawa told his two colleagues, translated as, do your best, or rather, do more than your best. It would be the last time all three men spoke to one another. When Awuchi arrived in the hospital on October 3rd, it almost seemed impossible that he was the highly exposed worker claimed on televisions around the country. To the surprise of the nurses and doctors treating him, he was able to talk in his private room in the intensive care unit, albeit a bit sluggishly, and the only apparent physical injury was a severe reddening of his right arm, the arm that had been held directly over the precipitation tank. His salivary glands were swollen, and yet, it seemed, that was it. Nurses were hopeful. They established the ultimate goal as a Wuchi being able to leave the intensive care unit, something that they thought could happen if they all persevered. The following day, 
once Orochi had settled and nurses had established a care routine for him, Dr. Meikawa contacted 13 departments across the hospital. And at noon of that day, staff from these departments gathered, including cell therapy and transplantation medicine, dermatology, gastroenterology, infectious diseases, blood transfusions, the clinical laboratory, intensive care, and radiology. Each of these departments designated a representative to support the group, such that if a symptom arose, it could be treated as quickly as possible. This became the Radiation Emergency Treatment Team, led by Meikawa, and built around emergency treatment and cell transplantation. A 145 square meter conference room was used at 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. every day for these representatives to gather and discuss the care of Orochi and his future treatment. Discussions were heated, on occasion exceeding two hours in length, with medical examinations on Orochi occurring at 7 a.m. At this point, Orochi was a cheerful and talkative patient, regularly engaging in conversation. Despite the fact he was constantly surrounded by people who were monitoring him, he never worried about his own condition. Orochi was constantly making jokes. When one of the nurses was wiping him, he jokingly said, I'm embarrassed, go get my wife. With all of the experiments performed on him already, as well as the medical equipment attached to his body, he couldn't help but joke, I look like a guinea pig, don't I? However, that day, he asked one of the nurses, when you're exposed to radiation like this, is there a risk of contracting leukemia or something? Or what she was afraid, he was choosing not to show it. The glimmer of hope only lasted two days. The morning of October 5th, his Amaru Hirai of the Cell Therapy and Transplantation Medicine Department examined micrographs of Wachi's DNA collected from his bone marrow on October 3rd. What they showed him was stunning. The now iconic image of Owuchi's DNA, fragmented, fused, unrecognisable. Without this vital DNA, there was no chance of the hematopoietic stem cells located in his bone marrow recovering. And without these hematopoietic stem cells, he would not be able to recover his white blood cells or platelets. By the time Owuchi had arrived at the hospital, Owuchi's white blood cell count was already zero. To protect him from any infections, as even a common cold would have killed him, Owuchi was already placed in a private sterile room, but then they added a separate decontamination room made from the only other private room in the intensive care unit. Everyone and everything that passed through had to be decontaminated. Twice daily, blood samples were taken, and polymerase chain reactions, or PCR, tests were performed to detect any bacterial, viral, or fungal infections. It was necessary to perform experimental treatment on Owuchi, something that had been attempted on the victims at Chernobyl to little success, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. While commonly used as a leukemia treatment, to perform this in such a critical patient was seldom attempted. They would need specialist advice. This came in the form of Dr. Robert Peter Gale, who had performed these treatments at Chernobyl and assisted at many other accidents, including the Goyanya nuclear accident. Before they could begin, however, they would need to find a suitable match for Owuchi's DNA, which they would then be able to collect a sample of. Before receiving these micrographs, they had already started the search, and, even luckier for them, there was a match. A person who happened to be in the same hospital they were in right then, Hisashi Uwuchi's sister, who had decided to remain there with the rest of her family while Uwuchi was in care. She offered her cells, as many as it took, to treat her brother. On October 6, Uwuchi's sister was lying in a bed, having spent days taking drugs to increase the number of hematopoietic stem cells that had been released into her blood. A machine was used to extract her blood 
filter the stem cells, and return the blood, taking up most of the day. In another room in the hospital, her brother was undertaking a far more painful treatment. When Awachi arrived at the University of Tokyo Hospital, x-rays had been performed on his chest, and the sight was not promising. Awachi had been constantly complaining about thirst, no matter how much fluid he received. It was something that many radiation exposure patients complain of. The reason why was that his blood vessels had become more permeable following exposure. While at the National Institute, his lungs had appeared normal. Now they were surrounded by a large volume of white on the x-rays, which could only be fluid. Awuchi was suffering from a pulmonary edema. As fluid built up in the alveoli of his lungs, he would effectively drown to death with oxygen unable to reach his blood. It was a difficult choice on what to do. The stem cell transplants hadn't been carried out, and they had already seen that removing the medical tape from Awuchi's body was leaving blisters that refused to heal. Would any invasive procedures be safe from a medical standpoint? They ultimately decided yes, and chose to administer Awuchi a pleural puncture. This procedure involved inserting a needle into the pleural cavity surrounding Awuchi's lungs and applying a mask uncomfortably tight to Awuchi's face, through which a high pressure volume of oxygen would be forced into Awuchi's lungs forcing them to expand, and causing the water to be removed through the needle. After days of countless tests and stress and anxiety over his own fate, uncertainty over whether he was going to live or die, Awuchi's cheerful and friendly nature was replaced by that of what he really was, a scared and vulnerable human who didn't know what was happening to him. His outcries were recorded in the medical documents. I can't take it anymore. Stop it. I want to go back to Ibaraki. Mother, don't leave me. When Awuchi was offered encouragement, he retorted with, I don't want to do this anymore. Forget the treatment. I'm leaving. And then, a few seconds later, I'm not a guinea pig. But the plural effusion was a success and 830 milliliters of fluid that had built up in each lung was removed. The x-rays returned from a grim sight to a promising outlook, and the following day, his sister's hematopoietic stem cells were transplanted into his blood system, an image widely circulated through the press as a hope of his recovery. Now they would have to wait and see if the cells would graft themselves onto the bone marrow and begin to produce new white blood cells. But on October 9th, Awuchi's breathing deteriorated to the point that his uptake of oxygen was falling to dangerous levels. Not enough of it was reaching his brain, and vivid hallucinations began. Awuchi became convinced that he was now in the back of a truck, being transported to an uncertain fate. Pentoxyphylline, which had been withdrawn from the Japanese market due to a lack of evidence it was a beneficial treatment for cerebral vascular disorders, disorders affecting the blood vessels of the brain, but was beneficial for pulmonary diseases such as pneumonia, was selected as the best treatment. But by the time that the negotiations to get the drug were finished, Awuchi was no longer able to ingest medicine orally. To bypass this, the National Institute of Radiological Sciences collaborated with the government and pharmaceutical companies in Thailand to import a version of the drug they could administer directly into his blood. Even with this drug, Awuchi was approaching dyspnea, feeling like he couldn't breathe deep or fast enough. I'm in pain, I'm suffering, he told the nurses. Speaking was difficult, but when his wife, Chizuru, arrived to visit him, he managed to call her by her nickname and tell her, I love you. Chizuru felt embarrassed, but Awuchi seemed to know what was going to happen the following day. October 10th, Awuchi fully lapsed into dyspnea. He was going to die from a lack of oxygen if the medical team didn't act immediately. Awuchi was intubated, and artificial respiration control began, assisting his ability to breathe. But otherwise, aside from the sunburn appearance to his arm, Awuchi still looked healthy. 
there was still a chance of recovery. Aside from some bleeding in Owuchi's mouth as the mucus lining began to slough off, which was expected and rapidly treated, Owuchi's condition stabilised under the intubation for the next few days, as hormones were administered to promote regeneration of the tissues that made up his lungs. He was still conscious and could communicate. Despite spending most of the day sedated, when he was alert, he could grip the hand of a person talking to him, or nod and shake his head in response to questions such as if he was in pain. And while Owuchi was bedbound, his family spent their time in the waiting room, calmly folding paper cranes, a symbol of their hope for recovery. And then, the sign everyone was waiting for. On October 16th, at midnight, Owuchi's white blood cell count jumped from 300 cells per millimetre cubed of blood to 600. By 6am, it was 1,000. A sample of his blood was taken and a dye applied to the white blood cells that would attach to the X chromosomes. If it was his sister's cells, there would be two distinct markers. And there was. By October 17th, this number had jumped to 6,500, an average amount for a healthy person. On October 18th, he reached 8,000. He was recovering. The first hurdles, the lung damage, and the collapse of his immune system were cleared. Optimism surged through the hospital. Perhaps the impossible could be done. But life for Owuchi was still difficult. Still no verbal communication and no access to the outside world. With the accident being Japan's biggest news event of the year, all he would have heard was speculation on him and his colleagues. Instead, CDs playing Owuchi's favourite songs, such as his favourite singer Celine Dion, were played in the room to keep him entertained when he wasn't sedated. The artificial respiration system kept Owuchi pinned on his back and left him shuffling uncomfortably while conscious. Endoscopies were performed to ensure his intestines were healthy, and when it was confirmed, Meikawa attempted to perform a nutrient absorption through his intestines. 150 grams of nutrients were entered into his stomach through a tube down his nose. 100 grams reached his intestines, and then 100 grams of green mucus was ejected as stool. Nutrient absorption had failed, the attempts were abandoned, and this coincided with the start of Owuchi's intestinal degradation. At the same time, the reddening of Owuchi's right arm began to blister the skin damage was starting to occur. With the loss of stem cells proliferating at the basal layer of his skin, now there was no new cells to replace those that flaked off. The fluid building up around the tissue to cushion it was his body's last attempt to save his skin layer. Immediately, Uwuchi was transferred to a tilt bed that could rotate side to side to alleviate the pressure on Uwuchi's body throughout the day, reducing the rate of skin loss and therefore the spread of blisters. When his wife saw him, she told him, oh honey, they've turned you into a robot. The blisters were unique to anything the medical team had seen before. They could only describe them as cobblestone, the blisters filling with serous fluid, a yellow fluid normally found around the organs of the body, and large blood clots that were fusing together in a red-black colour. Owuchi's body began to darken to black. Reddening spread as well to the areas most affected. October 20th, blisters appeared on his right thigh. October 22nd, the blisters spread to his left thigh and appeared behind his neck. October 23rd, they were now appearing on the front of his torso and on his face. By October 25th, this had become a major problem as the blisters began to cover his entire body, and when they burst, they began to induce blood loss from his skin. And the next day, Owuchi's situation became even worse. A green, watery stool was beginning to discharge, something they had never seen in radiation exposure, which was normally bloody at this stage. There were two causes narrowed down. 
either a new manifestation of radiation exposure or Awuchi's sister's cells were attacking his body, a phenomenon known as graft versus host disease. An immediate endoscopy was performed, and when they looked into his small intestines, the white mucus was hanging dead, and the submucosal layer was a dark red. On the 28th of October, at the request of the National Institute of Radiological Sciences, Awuchi was visited by doctors from the United States of America, Russia, France and Germany. Awuchi had survived 29 days so far, 20 more than the previous record for a neutron beam exposure. One of these, Fred Mettler, provided his diagnosis on the diarrhea, confirming it was due to the radiation damage and not graft versus host disease. Fred Mettler further suggested that, in a few weeks, the diarrhea would subside. One way to confirm this would be to extract intestinal cells to check for his sister's cells attacking them. However, this was too risky as it could lead to intestinal hemorrhaging and was therefore not carried out. Another issue arose this day that the doctors were asked their opinions on. The decay of the muscles in Awuchi's right arm was releasing myoglobin into the blood. This myoglobin, released from the muscles if they were suffering from necrosis, is highly toxic if not filtered out by his kidneys. This was of great concern for Awuchi's condition, as his kidneys were beginning to fail. The Russian specialist insisted, when told of this, that Awuchi's right arm should be amputated. Meikawa and the other specialists disagreed. There was no way that Awuchi would survive the amputation, and the wound would never heal. The specialists delivered their report that evening. Historically speaking, similar cases of irradiation have resulted in fatal consequences in one to two weeks. As a result of thorough intensive care, including hematopoietic factors and the peripheral blood stem cell transplantation from his HLA compatible sister, Uwuchi is still alive 29 days after irradiation. And then they concluded with, the University of Tokyo Hospital staff is in the unique position of providing treatment for a condition without medical precedent, and the advice we can give them is limited. Awuchi's future remained in uncertainty. In 15 hours, Awuchi lost more than 1.2 kilograms of mucus through his diarrhea. This condition worsened on the following day, in which Awuchi lost nearly 1.8 kilograms of mucus in 16 hours. His kidney function continued to worsen despite the medication and the concentration of myoglobin in his blood worsened, approaching lethal concentrations gradually. At this point in time, Awuchi's most burnt portions of his body were his right arm and his left hand, followed by his thighs. It seemed every day that the condition of one region would suddenly worsen. The 30th of October was a more positive day for Awuchi's condition. The diarrhea decreased to 600 grams in 16 hours. Blood production increased dramatically. And the treatment for GVHD was commenced to help reduce diarrhea. There was no way to observe what was happening inside Awuchi aside from the use of x-rays which showed little change despite the decrease of oxygen intake. However, the skin peeling had reached his back on the right side, the side closest to the tank. Around this time, a section of 2cm by 4cm skin on the Wuchi's sister's thigh was extracted and sent to be cultured. The cultured skin will not arrive until day 50. Halloween 1999 32 days after exposure. Awuchi's family was still folding paper cranes, while his kidneys and liver continued to suffer, and nitrogen spiked in his blood. Damage to the skin and mucus increased, and special ointment was added to Awuchi's eyes to stop them from drying, while they continued to bleed. Whenever Awuchi's feet were washed, the skin would be rubbed off. In order to prevent Awuchi losing blood or an infection entering through the spots of hemorrhaging that dotted Uwuchi's torso and arms, he was covered head to toe in gauze, preventing his family from touching his body ever again. While the gauze was being changed, 
the temperature of the room was raised to 30 degrees Celsius, leaving Meikawa and the other nurses who changed the gauze dripping in sweat. In order to prevent his body from suffering from infection, his body was coated in a warm antiseptic, and the gauze that was used was Trex gauze, known for being soft and preventing further skin being rubbed off of a wuchi. On several days, nearly a litre of fluid seeped out of him and had to be replenished. After Owuchi's transfer to the University of Tokyo Hospital, Shinohara remained at the National Institute for Radiological Sciences for two more days. His condition monitored closely. On October 4th, Shinohara was transferred to the Institute of Medical Science, part of the University of Tokyo Hospital. At this point, issues were becoming present in Shinohara. His white blood cell count was dropping rapidly and the National Institute for Radiological Sciences was not equipped to deal with this. His transfer was much quieter than the Wuchi's, however there was still significant coverage of it. A search was placed for a donor match in Shinohara, however none emerged. As a result, Shinohara was set to be given an umbilical cord transplant. These have benefits of their own, in that it reduces the risk of the graft attacking the host after transplantation, as well as having no physical demand on the donor of the cells. Despite the fact that Shinohara's white blood cell count had reached zero by October 6, Shinohara had remained in a stable condition and was able to communicate just fine. There were no signs of skin loss, nor diarrhea, nor vomiting aside from that which followed the initial exposure. On October 10th, transplantation of the cord blood cells occurred. In this procedure, previously collected stem cells from the umbilical cord of a delivered baby are inserted into the bloodstream of the patient, which enter the bone marrow of the patient and then remain there, eventually to differentiate into a white blood cell and replace those that were no longer produced. It would take them many days to see if the transplant would be a success. At this point, the skin of his face was damaged with red and yellow burns appearing across it. By October 12th, further signs of radiation damage were beginning to manifest. Pain was developing in Shinohara's mouth, and it was increasing substantially. It was confirmed not to be a result of infection, despite the lack of white blood cells, and Shinohara remained conscious and lucid. This worsened on the 13th, and it was soon discovered that, on the 14th, the mucous membrane had turned red inside of his mouth. As well as this, ulcers were forming on the lining of his cheeks. There was no change to Shinohara's condition, externally. And this was good. They had time to prepare for the oncoming radiation damage that would progress in Owuchi's body before his. Over the 15th, sores worsened further inside his mouth. A fever was beginning to show signs of manifesting and this was resulting in the furthering of inflammation of his oral cavity, causing further pain and distress to Shinohara's condition. This fever and inflammation came together on the 16th when Shinohara proceeded to vomit. Following this, intense throat pain began to assail his condition. On the 17th, the medical team concluded it was highly likely that he was suffering from an infection that had taken advantage of his failing immune system, and administered antibiotics to treat whatever was assailing him. At this point, intravenous feeding began. On the 18th, bone marrow cells were taken, while medication to help treat Shinohara deal with his throat pain was given. The medication helped to reduce the damage to the inside of his mouth. That being said, Shinohara was still in a critical condition, however stable he seemed at that point. There was no known damage to his intestines or lungs, and while Owuchi's thighs and arms were blistering at this point, Shinohara's skin was generally stable. Shinohara had received 8 sieverts of radiation, while Owuchi had received approximately 20. Any sign of deterioration in Shinohara's body would have been slower to arrive. On the 19th, further improvement was detected inside Shinohara's mouth such that he was feeling less pain there. That being said, another issue was becoming present. 
subtle pain was being felt in Shinohara's fingertips. Stronger medication for this in his throat was given on the 20th of October, to limit any damage it was causing. On the 21st of October, day 22 after exposure, it was confirmed that the cells from the cord transplant had taken, with his own cells coexisting with the transplanted cells, and that Shinohara would begin to produce new white blood cells. His immunodeficiency would begin to sort itself out. However, that was the only positive. The pain in Shinohara's throat and fingertips worsened, despite the stronger medication, with the colour of his skin reddening on his fingertips, starting to swell. More pain was felt in his feet. After 22 days of constant examination, Shinohara was finally beginning to feel exhausted too, and this would have an adverse effect on his treatment. The change stabilised, however, the following day, and so the medical team were able to administer even stronger medication to relieve the pain and counteract the swelling. The number of white blood cells in Shinohara's blood increased, and so they were able to truly confirm he was beginning to recover. Shinohara had been considerably more stable than Awuchi over the duration of his first 24 days of treatment. As Shinohara's blood cells recovered, the 23rd of October was also a positive, as the swelling didn't increase, and nor did the changing colour of Shinohara's skin. However, this was because Shinohara was still technically in the latency period, in which the damage of radiation sickness was much lower, and this was ending. Now Shinohara's true battle against radiation sickness began. On the 24th of October, the pain began to worsen, and swelling on Shinohara's face rose. Despite this, Shinohara was entirely conscious and lucid, with little given in terms of sedatives. Shinohara could sleep through the pain, and it didn't disrupt much of his daily routine while in care, at this point in time. The next day, Shinohara's fingertips and the soles of his feet turned numb, accompanied by a stabbing pain in the general area, instead of confinement to simply that region. Shinohara's exhaustion was continuing to rise, as sleeping was becoming a slight difficulty. Most of the swelling was still confined to Shinohara's face. By the 26th, blisters arising from Shinohara's fingertips spread down across his hands and to his wrists on both sides, making the simple task of holding objects nearly impossible. The temperature of his fever continued to rise. The 27th saw confirmation that donor cells were helping to assist Shinohara's white blood cell count and accelerating recovery. Despite the positive, blisters expanded across the soles of his feet, leaving him confined to his bed. They spread further on the 28th, however. However, at this point, the inflammation of Shinohara's throat had declined to the point that he could consume a liquid diet. By the 29th, the pain in Shinohara's throat had declined significantly, and the pain he felt in his hands and feet was also declining. Following this day, his fever broke, and Shinohara's condition remained stable into November. Yutaka Yokokawa did not need to be transferred to another hospital. Everything that he required to recover was kept at the National Institute. Due to the low dosage, it was not expected that Yokokawa's white blood cell count would drop significantly, and his bone marrow would recover and produce new cells. Perhaps the most serious issues for Yokokawa at the moment were in fact those of his own doing, and how they could impact his recovery or even cause an unprecedented manifestation of radiation sickness in him. Yokokawa was, like Owochi, a smoker, and one of the issues stemmed from his respiratory tract and how radiation damage could significantly increase his risk of cancer, and other respiratory issues may also develop. The second was that Yokokawa was a sufferer of type 2 diabetes. During radiation exposure, such as that of radiotherapy, your body can release sugar into the blood to cope with treatment. As his body was not responding to insulin, his blood sugar levels were rising dangerously high. That being said, Yokokawa was still suffering from the same issues as that of Hisashi Owuchi and Masato Shinohara, initially. His white blood cell count plummeted to a very low number, 
and Yokokawa was at risk of an infection spreading to him and causing potentially lethal symptoms. To prevent this from happening, Yokokawa was transferred to a room in which he was virtually sealed from the outside world. People who entered to give him food or to talk to him had to wear sterilised gowns and to be decontaminated before being allowed to enter. This worked, and so Yokokawa was able to avoid infection. Still, on the 14th of October, day 15 after exposure, Yokokawa's white blood cell count began to decline, having previously recovered, and then plummeted on the 16th. This was followed by his platelet count decreasing, leaving him susceptible to cuts and other injuries. A platelet transfusion was given on the 17th to minimise the damage, and while these elevated them for two days, they started dropping again. To compensate, Yokokawa was moved from his previous isolation chamber to a much more sterile one, and procedures were ramped up to further prevent the risk of infection. Furthermore, to help accelerate Yokokawa's recovery, more blood platelet transfusions were given, the first on the 20th and the second on the 23rd. Thankfully for Yokokawa, his white blood cell count began to recover again and reached a safe level on the 27th of October, at which point isolation was relaxed and Yokokawa and the medical staff of the National Institute for Radiological Sciences could relax. What was most likely the worst that radiation could deal against Yokokawa had passed, and he had emerged uninjured on the other side. 